The title of this message is called The Real Picture of Antichrist. Today I want to present to you two perspectives of Antichrist. Generally in modern Christianity, the Antichrist is seen mainly as a political figure, a dark political strongman who will lead a one-world government. He is expected to either wage a third world war or win a third world war. He will persecute Christians and Israel is expected to play a central role. Gorbachev, former leader of the Soviet Union, was one such candidate. Putin and Xi Jinping of China are some modern candidates. Elon Musk has also been proposed as a candidate. It plays out something like this. A third world war is waged, or perhaps there is an economic crash. In the midst of this chaos, a dark but charismatic political messiah emerges to lead one of the major nations or a confederacy of nations into a new world order. Israel is caught in the crosshairs. Somewhere along this timeline, either before or after the Third World War, a third temple is built, and the Antichrist persecutes Israel and Christians, desecrates the temple. He will be totalitarian, powerful, and influential in that he causes people to not buy or sell by controlling the world economic system. And on the slide that I currently had, um, we see uh, Nikolai from the Left Behind series. So, um, so how will he control the world economic system in, in the mainstream understanding of Christianity? So this may be done with microchips being mandated for all those who wish to participate in the new world economy. As war rages, Israel may be surrounded, nuked, or about to be nuked, and Christ will emerge in the midst of this battle of Armageddon to set up a thousand-year millennial kingdom centered in Israel and to wage war on the enemies of Israel and Christians, saving the day and defeating the Antichrist. The righteous are expected to immediately reign with Christ on earth over the wicked for 1,000 years. That's the very basic picture of prophecy in Christendom today. But here's the thing. Christ's first warning in Matthew 24 was to, quote, take heed that no man deceive you. The seven-day Adventist perspective of prophecy and the Antichrist is centered on this warning, specifically religious deception. Christ references false prophets and false Christ emerging. Revelation 13 speaks of false miracles occurring. People will emerge in the name of Christ to deceive many. The Christian world is wholly unprepared for false prophets and false Christians emerging, wolves in sheep's clothing, to steer Christianity to destruction. The Christian world is all too focused on external political evils and a political strongman antichrist rather than religious deceptions, false doctrines, and pretenders of the faith, which are far more dangerous. The Bible declares, speaking of the Antichrist, that by peace he shall destroy many. The Christian world itself can become an evil that far outdoes any purely political Antichrist. Let me present the evidence at hand for the seven-day Adventist understanding of prophecy. Point number one. The secular and religious must work together. Christ was crucified by the Roman political system at the beckoning of the religious establishment of his day, at the beckoning of Caiaphas the high priest and the Pharisaic priesthood. The Roman government was pressured into crucifying Christ, on which the Jewish people proclaimed, his blood be on us and on our children. The government and religious bodies come together, came together to crucify Christ. There is but one perspective in the religious world predominantly, that the political bodies will persecute the Christians. Yet we see that it is the religious that pressured the government to kill Christ. And in the Dark Ages, this happened again when the church in the form of the papacy pressured the governments under her dominion to persecute and kill those who would not conform to the dictates of the Catholic Church. 
The scriptures declare that there is coming a day when those who persecute us will think they are doing God a service. This is talking about professed believers persecuting believers, not merely secular governments persecuting Christians. This opens a possibility that the professed Christian world itself can become so deceived by false prophets and false Christs, by the power in Revelation 13 that causes fire to come down from heaven, that they themselves become part of the Antichrist system. Point number two, both claim to be serving God. The story of Cain and Abel shows us how persecution plays out. Cain murdered his brother Abel. Both professed to be serving God. Cain served God in the way he saw fit by offering vegetables, but Abel served God in the way God saw fit by offering an animal sacrifice. And when Abel was accepted and Cain rejected, he rose up and slew his brother. Is it possible that some in the religious world are like Cain, who are intent on serving God as they see fit, and others are like Abel, intent on serving God as he sees fit? Is it possible that as the events of prophecy play out, these two classes will become more distinct? Will Cain rise up against Abel and persecute his brother? Even Christ declares, the weeds will grow amongst the wheat until the harvest. So the second coming of Jesus, which is the harvest, must have something to do with the state of the church, the religious establishment, Christianity, and not merely secular figures. On the slide I just had, um, we see a picture of, of uh, a woman being burnt at the stake, which happened pretty frequently during the Dark Ages. That was religious people in the name of God killing other religious people. Point number three, Satan enters the churches. The Bible declares that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light and his ministers ministers of righteousness. In other words, Satan will make his end time stand in the churches, which makes sense because he always wanted to occupy the position of Christ and so he aims to overtake the churches by which Christ is professedly hid and or is professed to be worshipped. So how is the Antichrist system emerging? I'd like to outline a prophecy with these three points in mind. The religious world must play a significant part. The ecumenical movement seeks to hold dialogue with all religions, and the Roman Catholic Church has been leading the charge. If we believe in love, it is said, and put all doctrine aside, then we all may seek unity. Therefore, believing that Jesus Christ is the only way by which a person can be saved would be an affront to these ministers. Already we see a scenario emerging. Those who hold the position that Christ is the only way by which men can be saved, and that the Bible is doctrinally true, and that other ways must therefore be false, will be scoffed as unloving and intolerant by the religious world. Those Christians that toe the line with this ecumenical movement will be serving God as they see fit, rather than serve God as he sees fit, in which case they are no better than Cain. The ecumenical movement waits for a Christ, as many religions do, but it is a universal Christ who will accommodate all religions. This is known as the New Age Christ, or as stated, the Universal Christ. When people say they come in the name of Christ, we must ponder, what Christ? Another movement is the Charismatic Movement, which is part of the deception of the last days. Uncontrollable laughter, euphoric weeping and wailing, vain babbling, feelings of fire causing the body to convulse and people to uncontrollably and frenetically move, are spirits of demons, strange fire working in Christianity. The false prophets of Revelation 13 that causes fire to come down from heaven will be a greater, more decisive manifestation of even this. 
and will be very convincing, unlike anything seen yet. The belief in the immortality of the soul means that for many, the door is also open for dead loved ones to speak to them, or for apostles and prophets to emerge in spirit form and speak to them, just like Saul. This is another dire development that is already being introduced into the world through spiritualism and accepted into the church with things like transcendental meditation and spiritualistic visions. And what have these things done to Christianity? Many people, many sound-minded people, looking at the state of Christianity today become repulsed by it. The people who are trying to get people's money, who are snake oil salesmen, trying to um, sell a kind of Christianity that supposedly heals people when it doesn't, um, this kind of uncontrollable um, manifestation in the churches where people are falling over and weeping and wailing. For many onlooking, it's a strange thing. It's a, it's a thing that has put off many people to, from uh, Christianity. And when they look at the private jets and the and the uh, money that many people are racking in, they wonder, is this Christianity? Is this the gospel that Jesus taught? And many people become repulsed. And so we see that religious deception is a major thing for the end times. And of course, all roads lead to Rome. And so in the slide we have leading, the, leading, um, the leading Christian um, men and women who are, who are pushing this ecumenical uh, movement. And these are professedly Protestants who are pushing this ecumenical movement. And so all roads lead back to Rome. And it's not uncommon for, for there to be charismatic Catholics who also receive the supposedly um, indwelling of the Holy Spirit and start speaking in vain babblings and so on and so forth. And so the charismatic movement is a one-way train back to Rome, and Rome is the leader of the ecumenical movement in the world today. So what events can we expect to play out with all this in mind? The seven-day Adventist understanding of prophecy goes as follows. The great religious bodies of the world will unite with the governments of the world in pushing their version of religion and governance, and persecuting those who refuse to toe the line. In Christ's day, this was done by the Jewish Roman power, uniting to destroy Christ and his followers. In the Dark Ages, this was done by the Catholic European power, seeking to destroy, quote-unquote, heretics who stood for the Bible alone and not the dictates of popes. And in our day, a threefold union is emerging in Christianity, between Catholic, apostate Protestant, and spiritualistic religion. Let this be clear, the churches in the United States will not be exempt. The government and religious bodies will unite, and religious people in the name of serving God and country will end up persecuting their brethren who decide to play no part in the false, ecumenical, spiritualistic, charismatic religion of the day. The American brand of Christianity can be very conservative, even with all these people who are falling over, weeping and wailing, babbling, receiving euphoric visions. It can be very conservative, and in the name of seeking to further Christianity, can be foremost in violating the separation of church and state in order to seize political power for their religious aims. And because it is a human trait to look for strong men in times of depression, Christians can give up their independence of thought for heady, strong religious leaders who will lead the masses into destruction in the name of reviving Christianity or their version of it. So a kind of Christian fascism can emerge to be a reaction against the secularism of the day. If the religious elements of society are seeking to gain political power, then what are they to use this power for? Environmental concerns mingled with religious reasoning of the need to spiritualize an increasingly secular society to give people family time will beckon governments to pass a national day of rest on Sunday. 
We already had lockdowns. Seeing the ecological catastrophe and the social instability, a Sunday mandate will be like a lockdown, but once a week, with all ceasing commerce on that day for the environment and for religious and social purposes. And so I have on the slide there the Green Sabbath movement. You can look it up yourself. People are wanting to legislate Sunday as a day of rest in order to protect the environment. And many religious people too are behind this movement because they believe in Sunday sacredness and they believe that it can be a good time for family and for worship and stuff. And so the world is heading in that direction, or at least the movements of the world are pushing in that direction for a Sunday day of rest. This is not something that um, is out of, the, out of the blue, actually. It's something that you can look into yourself, the Green Sabbath movement. Governments will become more oppressive on dissenters. The scriptures will be fulfilled. There will be no buying and selling for those who do not support the new emerging church-state regimes. Then the scriptures will be fulfilled, 1 John 3, 11 to 12. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. People will persecute one another thinking they are doing God a service. Religious Christians around the world will feel they are contributing to a new glorious Christian age. And so we see from 1 John 3, 11 to 12, that Cain persecuted his brother Abel. And why did he persecute him? Because his works were evil and his brother was righteous. And so this is an internal um, dispute between two professed believers. And that has been the trajectory of persecution even up until today, during the Dark Ages. It was professed believers persecuting professed believers. And a servant is not greater than his master. If we are to follow Christ, then we must suffer persecution as well. And so the one persecuting is not following the example of Christ, but the one being persecuted is following the example of Christ. So what is the catalyst that makes all this happen? What is the event that causes the world to march into forestated position? Wars, national division, spiritualistic manifestations, persecution, natural disasters will only increase. And then the part that many modern Christian uh, prophecy believers will come true. Christ will emerge in Israel. His feet touching the ground and will appear in other parts of the world also at different times to save the day and reign with the world's religious, ecumenical, and political leaders, to usher in the long-expected millennia or new age. All the world will halt and pay homage to this wonder-working Christ. So who is this Christ? I told you before, when people say they believe in Christ or come in the name of Christ, we must ask, what Christ? Take a look at these prophetic quotes. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will, appear, will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come! Christ has come! The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them. And Christ, as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious, heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy 
the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels in keeping Holy Sunday. This is a strong and almost overmastering delusion. Like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus, the multitudes from the least to the greatest give heed to these sorceries, saying, this is the great power of God. Another quote follows, but the people will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. And furthermore, Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's coming. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point and has clearly foretold the manner of his second coming. There will arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Friends, while the Christian world is looking for a political strongman antichrist and is preoccupied with Israel and the Middle East, the religious antichrist system is already in position. There's only one system that frequently and consistently unites church and state to further its cause, has done so historically, and assumes temporal powers even today, and that's the Catholic Church. Should the Protestant American churches attempt to do the same, they will only be following in their mother's footsteps. And finally, because the Christian world is looking for Christ to reign a earthly millennial kingdom on earth, to reign over the wicked, and already many spiritualistic and heathen religions are seeking the new age Christ to bring about the new age. The Christian world is ready to accept the coming of Lucifer pretending to be Christ. He will lead the world into perdition. Add to that the casting aside of doctrine for spiritualistic manifestations and feelings, and the world will be all too ready to embrace their senses and not uncover the delusion to occur in the world. First, false workers do miracles to cause the world to believe in them. Then they lead people into perdition. Even so, first Satan must come as Christ. Then he, in his assumed character, he will set up the kingdom of the beast and the mark of the beast. I remember watching uh, a pastor on YouTube who convinced his church members to eat grass now, if a pastor can convince church members to eat grass and that's occurring in the Christian world and we, and, and we know that that is uh, a deception, then how much more someone, a miracle worker, who is charismatic, who comes in the name of Christ, who does miracles, how much more would people believe that? When people say Christ is coming, we have to ask, what Christ? That, that's what I'm trying to hint at that uh, Jesus Christ taught that many false Christs and false prophets would come. People telling people to eat grass, their congregations to eat grass. People saying they need jumbo jets with millions of dollars. People saying that if you fall over, euphoric, weeping and wailing, that that's somehow a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure what falling over actually does. But um, these things are happening in the professionally Christian world even today. And so we have to be on guard. We have to understand that the Antichrist is not merely some political figure that leads armies of people and to persecute Christians, but there's deception involved in this, people. And the Bible declares that by peace shall the Antichrist system destroy many. They come to you in, as wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, with sophistries, saying that they're serving God, saying that they believe in Christ, saying that Jesus is the way, but then they lead people to eat grass or they, lead pe they take people's money uh, on jumbo jets, you know, or they make people fall over. They devour widows' houses. Is this Christianity? Certainly not. And yet this is everywhere. And many people, many people who, good, sincere people who have gone to churches have been burnt. They have been scammed of money or they see that people, it's, it's one big game. And they've been burnt, and so they, they discard Christianity altogether. And I'm sympathetic with those people. The false Christ will emerge. And this quote is telling. Then, in the midst of this great turmoil, Satan will appear in different parts of the earth in unsurpassed glory. This is from Ministry Magazine. It's a great quote. He comes, a majestic being of dazzling brightness, to the Islamic world in the way the Mahdi is expected 
and the Muslims bow down on their prayer carpets before the rightly guided one who will usher in the thousand years of peace in glory unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. He arrives among the Hindus who see him as Kalki, the final and climactic incarnation of Vishnu. The Jews rejoice. Their long-awaited Mashiach has finally arrived, not as a humble servant, but as they have been expecting, a powerful king who will end the messianic woes. The Buddhists see Maitreya come to bestow blessings upon mankind. Meanwhile, Christians shout, Christ has come, Christ has come. All these groups, already confused about the nature of the advent, have been duped in the past by charlatans, which must less deceive to power than the devil. If people today believe that Sang Yang Moon is the returned Christ in Korea, then what will happen when Satan himself, in unsurpassed glory, makes the claim? What Christ are you looking for? Now the good news is that this system will come crashing down. The political powers that gave this false system their support will turn on her, seeing that they have been deceived. People will, quote, burn her with fire. Those who initially supported the false prophet will see that they have been conned. Her support will dry up and Babylon will self-destruct. Friends, the best way to meet this great delusion is to preempt it beforehand. People must understand the nature of, of Christ's coming as clearly outlined in the word of God. But the Bible does declare, it says, come out of her, my people, that within these false systems, there are genuine Bible-believing Christians who, who must be called out of these systems. And so if you're listening to this today, just remember that God is calling you out of these systems. God is saying, follow the word of God. Don't be duped by these wolves in sheep's clothing who tell people to eat grass and have jumbo jets and all these things, you know. You're smarter than that. And, um, you know, I would say that trust in Christ. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm a Bible-believing Christian fundamentalist. I do not toe the line with the ecumenical movement. I believe that there are there is one way by which men can be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ. And that means that other ways are wrong, and, uh, and Christ is the only way. And so I do not toe the line with the ecumenical movement that embraces all religions. Neither do I toe the line with the charismatic movement, where there's weeping and wailing and babbling and false miracles and all these things that are happening. And, uh, and so I choose to stand on the Bible I choose to stand on the Bible as the foundation of my faith. And I choose to believe in the Reformation, Martin Luther, John Wesley, John Huss, all those people. I choose to stand by what they have taught and they have consistently taught throughout the Reformation, throughout the Dark Age period, that the Pope is Antichrist. He persecuted Christians in the name of somehow serving God. And so I declare to you today that, that uh, the world is looking for a political strongman antichrist, one who will galvanize the world and lead armies and stuff. Yet we know from the Bible that religious deception is the key, and we must beware of religious deception. There are far more people in the world who are religious than are secular, and many have been deceived, and many can be deceived even in Christianity today. And so I leave you with that.